Hello, my name is Robert Drake. I'm the co-executive producer of the Atlanta Radio Theater Company. And on behalf of everyone at Artsy, we want to welcome you to our Necronomicon show. You can find us at ARTC.org or like us on Facebook and Twitter, and you can find our products at audible.com. This afternoon, we have a great show for you, including episodes of Mercury, a broadcast of hope, Dragon's Lament, Rory Rammer's Space Marshal, and the premiere of Ellie Rain's Nightingale. So remember, there is adventure in sound. We begin with Mercury, a broadcast of hope, a daily podcast about the zombie apocalypse. You can find it anywhere you get your podcasts or support it at patreon.com. Today's episode features Lissa Hoganson, Diana Lancaster, and was written and produced by David Benedict. Good morning, listeners, and welcome to Mercury, a broadcast of hope. I'm Max O'Brien, here today with Agnes Drew and Dr. Rosalind Clark. It's day 1087 since we came back on the air, and I have a big surprise for Agnes. Is it a good surprise? I think you'll like it. He told me about it before we got on the air. Well, don't keep me in suspense. Here. It's a book I found on my scavenging run the other day. I don't think I'd ever seen it in your collection, so I grabbed it. The best of H.P. Lovecraft. Oh. You don't like it? Not a horror fan? I mean, it's very thoughtful of you to bring it back, and I do like horror from time to time. It's it's just... Oh, we're living in a horror story right now. I should have known you might not like it. No, no, it's not that. It's just that... How much do you know about... H.P. Lovecraft. I know he had this whole mythos about Cthulhu and Relia, and he didn't write very descriptive stuff. I mean, he would sometimes go on about how indescribable the horror was, and then he would try to describe it. He was also very, very racist, and that's why I have trouble with his work. I think I'd heard that about him. Did it influence his writing? I confess, I've never read anything he wrote. It was hugely influential in his writing. A lot of his stories are about dehumanizing processes. Honestly, I'd really rather not talk about it on the air. It's so ugly when you get into it. I don't deny that he's a hugely influential writer, and a lot of great work has been inspired by him. So I guess I respect him as an artist, but it's not something I care to read myself. I appreciate you thinking of me though, Max. Wow, I didn't know any of that. And it really puts a highlight on separating the art from the artist. Is it, is it possible to even do that? I think it depends. I remember a lot of my colleagues in the arts departments talking about this from time to time. You have to take the whole thing into context and then figure out how you feel about it. Yeah. Lovecraft's racism was well known. It's just that at the time he was alive, his views weren't really outside the norm. Gradually, societal norms changed, but the racism that was in his writing stayed the same. So it's not like we didn't know. It's just that some people started to care more. In other cases, we sometimes didn't know about other aspects of an artist's life, When the body of work is pretty much complete, when the news that they were a terrible person who did terrible things comes out, then it forces everyone to look at that body of work in a different context. What about you, Max? How does this make you feel about the book you're holding in your hands? I think think it's important to recognize art for what it is. I think art isn't inherently good or bad. I think it's just like everything else. It depends on how you use it. Like, I remember reading a few articles before the zombies rose up about this sculpture on the side of a mountain in Georgia. Um, Can't remember the name. Oh, uh, Stone Mountain. Yeah, that's it. Guess I should have remembered that. Anyway, the sculpture is of three leaders of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson. 
the Confederacy was a terrible time in this country's history, and it's a shame that it's still glorified in some parts of the country. I never really understood why statues for the losing side were put up in so many places. But statues can be taken down. That sculpture is the largest bas-relief in the world, and it's a work of art that glorifies people who rebelled against their own country just so they could have the right to own other people. I remember reading about that too. Wouldn't taking it down also be really hard? I would imagine so. Stone Mountain is the largest exposed piece of granite in the whole world. You, you can't sandblast that sculpture off of it. It just physically wouldn't work. Your only real choices would be to send teams up there to chip it away the same way they sculpted it the first time, which would be hugely expensive and dangerous, or just blast it off with dynamite, which would leave a giant, ugly scar on the side of the mountain. I wonder what it looks like now. Three years of no maintenance or anything? Maybe nature's reclaiming itself. Wouldn't surprise me. As they say, life uh, finds a way. Yeah. Now we just need to find a way to get rid of these zombies and we can work on learning the lessons we've all been shown during this time. That's for another day, though. There's a lot to unpack here. Let's all think about it for a while. And maybe if we come to any new insights, we can revisit it on the air. For now, we've got to go. For Mercury, a broadcast of hope, this has been Max O'Brien, Dr. Rosalind Clark, and Agnes Drew. Take care of each other. And now the fantasy tale of Dragon's Lament, written by Paige Stedman, directed by Gan Monroe, and featuring Adam Ross and Krista Burton. Journal of Azora the Great, Imprisonment, Day 4, Evening. The moon is not yet full, the young human creature sleeps. It is becoming less annoying, or perhaps my imprisonment is affecting my judgment. We remain trapped in the cave, high in a cliff above strange desert sands. Fortunately, the magic imprisoning us seems to sustain our nutritional needs. The youngling still whines for a food out of habit, but does not seem to notice the lack of water. I was having the most wonderful dream. My brother was rescuing us. water in days. Only roast squeaky thing. And I'm fine. I must be tougher than I thought. That's me, Karina the Tough. I mean, now I'm thirsty. My mouth is so dry. Do you think we'll get any of that water dra- um, your majesty? You can call me dragon. Thanks. <laughs> Do you think we'll get any water? Oh, we're in a desert. Desert, rain, flash flood. Oh, it won't flood in the cave, will it? We are high on a cliff. Some water may perhaps trickle in through some cracks. Listen. To the storm? <sighs> Let me listen. There, that corner. Wait. The corner where the squeaky things come in? Um, any, anywhere else, perchance? <laughs> Silly hatchling, to be afraid of your food. <laughs> I, I am not! I'm not afraid. It's just, I'm, I'm not afraid of squeaky things. I just, well, I mean, they're dead when I eat them, okay? <laughs> and I'm not a hatchling. I do not hear squeaky things there now. Are you sure? <laughs> Thank you, dragon. 
it is very dark back here. Do you want flame, Corinna? Oh, no, no. No, thank you. I'm quite flammable, and I do not have a change of clothes. <laughs> I found it! There's water! Just a tiny trickle coming down the rock on the wall of the cave. Ooh, wish I had a proper cup. I can't... can't quite get in with my hands. Oh, I'm so thirsty! Dragon, please. Please. Please don't tell anyone about this. Rock water. Mm, they're full of healthful minerals. Oh. <laughs> well, at least my mouth feels a little better. Dragon, why don't you ever get hungry or thirsty? The enchantment is sustaining our needs. You don't need to eat or drink. Oh, wait. Our needs? Our? Mine too? Dragon, I have been eating squeaky thing and licking rock water off of walls. Why didn't you tell me? Uh, you did not ask. Also, it took me a few days to be sure of it. Why did I get hungry? You believed you should. But you didn't get hungry. Oh, yes. The first three days were... dicey. Oh. Uh, thank you for not eating me. I still feel the itching of hunger. Oh, uh, well, but, but we're friends now, right? But I know intellectually that it is better to eat adults who have bread. I have never bred. I'm only a teenager. Eating younglings too often may endanger the species. Uh, they are delicacies, however. We're talking about deer and sheep and things, right? I mean, you don't make a habit of eating, um, human. Sustainable hunting practices do not ease the false pangs of hunger when I think of how long it has been since I have eaten. I'm sure there will be more squeaky things tomorrow. Have, have you tried squeaky things? They're really good. <sighs> Dragon, um, your draconic majesty, I am very grateful that you haven't eaten. Have I mentioned that lately? <laughs> I never know when you're joking. You were joking, right? Hmm. The rain is stopping. That was so brief. Hmm. Short, but intense. Much like humans. Is that a height joke? I am tall for my age. I will have you know. Hmm. Uh, do you recognize any of these constellations? What is this, a quiz? Let me see. That could be the starfish. So the clouds are covering the lower half, so I'm not sure. Oh, that's the running child there. So yeah, that would be the starfish. The running child is west of the starfish, so that's north. And that's, um, yep, the banner is right there, just north of it. Though the pole is obscured by the clouds. Good. We are near your land, then. Uh, no deserts in Goldhem by Mountain. What about your kingdom, dragon? Kingdom? Queendom, then? Empire? Territory? We are far, far from my home. It must be lonely for you, too. No one could feel alone with you around. Aw, oh, thank you. The moon's, uh, moon. Is it waxing or waning? Um, 
waxing, I think. It's almost full. Good. Good? Why are, are some are you some like reverse swear dragon or something? <laughs> My magic will be boosted on the full moon. I will Your be magic? Able... Uh. You can break the magic barrier that's keeping us here? Oh, dragon! Dragon, you're my hero! You're the best dragon queen ever! We'll be free! I will be able to contact someone for assistance. Oh. Well, that's good. It's late. I should go back to sleep. Good night, dragon. Good night. Don't let the squeaky things bite. What? You said they were gone. <laughs> Dragon. Now I'll never get to sleep. Now it's time for Rory Rammer Space Marshal. The ongoing saga of Rory Rammer and his sidekick, Skip Sagan. Today's episode, The Green Man's Burden, was written by Ron N. Butler and directed by William Allen Rich. It features the talents of David Benedict, Billy Barefoot, Mark Collins, William Brown, and Paul Landry. It's time again for Rory Rammer Space Marshal! Come away with us now to the far off future days of 1985 AD after men have landed on the moon! When Space Marshal Rory Rammer and his sidekick Skip Sagan guard the rule of law and the rights of the innocent. From the skies of Earth to the orbit of the moon! And now for today's episode, The Green Man's Bird. We join Rory and Skip in the flyer of Bureau of Martian Affairs, Agent Brazos. Call me, Bubba. Beecham, speeding east from Solus Lacus City, Mars, for a ticklish treaty negotiation with the savage Aborigine leader, Two Moon. Bad luck, Marshal. This ship of your and crash landed out in green engine territory. Oh, I don't see where else the Reno could have set down. According to the map, the Aborigines own all the land for 500 kilometers downrange of the spaceport as a reservation. You'd almost think they'd set it up on purpose like that, wouldn't you? But they get real upset about rockets set down on their sacred land. It's a it's... Gee, Agent Beecham, why is the chief called Two Moons? Because Mars has two moons? <laughs> You'll just have to ask him yourself, youngster. Two Moons is a heap big chief among the Green Engine, and a sly old devil. Better leave the negotiating to an expert. Whoa, there's Two Moons camp right ahead. Down we go. And there's Two Moons a coming out of his dome now. How, Two Moons? How what? I see why they call him Two Moons, and it doesn't have anything to do with astronomy. <laughs> I find human children so delightful. Agent Beecham, perhaps you would be so good as to formally introduce us. Well, sure. This youngin' is going to get Skip Sagan to the Space Marshals. Delighted. Which hand do I shake? The right one, of course. Upper or lower? The upper one, I think. Here goes. As I said, delighted. Whew! Whew. And this here is Marshal Rory Rammer. Always happy to meet a member of our law enforcement community. You speak English very well, Chief. And you're too kind. I picked it up listening to the BBC Interplanetary Service. <laughs> I'm quite addicted to the Beeb. They'd run one situation comedy I never miss. The Royal Family Weekly Report. Perhaps you're familiar with it? I'm afraid not, Chief. Uh, should I call you, Chief? I'm comfortable with it. My full title is Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of the Board, the Barsoom Corporation Proprietary. But Chief is perfectly acceptable. Barsoom Corporation? Oh, yes. 
The tribe incorporated about four years ago. Our years, that is. We are traded on the new Tokyo Exchange. Ain't he a caution? Now, uh, Chief, about this big silver bird, Arn. Uh, big silver... Oh, the Reno. Yes, we have the site called an orb. A dreadful spiritual pollution of the sacred Red Hills, don't you know? Uh, by the by, did you get our medical subsidiary's bill for rescuing the crew? Uh, yeah. Now, the Great White Mother on Earth is prepared to remove all the wreckage and restore the landscaping free of charge. That's our off. Oh, dear, dear. I don't imagine your president would care to hear herself referred to in such a fashion. And as for the offer, I believe the Pan Martian Aboriginal Treaty of 1979 applies. I have the relevant volume tucked under my carapace here. Now let's see, volume 4, appendix B, paragraph 12.2B, Roman numeral 4-E. Ah, yes, here it is. Post facto landing fees for air slash spacecraft without previously approved landing permits and or acceptable crew and cargo manifests. Be scheduled B, list the amounts, and, well, the Reno, being in the 400,000 pound class, that comes to... Uh, That's a lot of smooths. I don't think the Bureau's budget can stretch to cover that this year. Or next. We suspected as much. But the tribe, uh, sorry, the board and I want to be reasonable about this. In lieu of a cash settlement, we are prepared to accept a transfer of Real property, similar to the last time. Oh. The last time? The Trotsky dropped a fuel tank in the middle of the natatorium of Qatar last summer. And two moons settled up for... A hotel. Quite a small one, really. Oh, so that's why the Solus Lakers Hilton has that sign by the front door that says, Property of Barsoom Corp. What'll it be this time, Chief? The municipal oxygen works? Agent Beecham, you wound me. No, if you will only look at this map. We are prepared to accept title to the market area west of Solus Lyca City in forfeit for any monetary claim against your bureau. Oh, yeah, sure. Huh. Sure. Uh, Agent Beecham? Excellent. Then simply apply your thumbprint here and sign here. An initial there, as a duly authorized agent of your government. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Marshal. Sonny, you chit-chat with the chief while I radio this back to my office at SL City. Hmm, a long, narrow parcel of land you have marked out there, chief. The astronomical alignment with the sunrise at the summer solstice is highly significant. Theologically speaking, that is. And it seems to coincide rather neatly with the route of the proposed Trans-Olympus Magnetic Railway I saw on the front page of the Solus Lacus news-free press back in town this morning. Really? I don't keep current with such matters. Nor, I suspect, does Agent Beecham. No! Though it's possible his superiors might be aware of such a project. Quick, Skip. We'd better grab him before he does something drastic. I say, uh, you don't really think he would hurt himself, do you? Uh, do restrain him. He's something of a burden sometimes, but we're fond of him, really. <laughs> That's all for today, kids! Join us next time for another exciting adventure and the conquest of space, which sometimes conquers right back with Rory Rather, Space Marshal! The Atlanta Radio Theater Company proudly presents Nightingale, Episode 1. Original story by Ellie Rain. Script by Billy Barefoot. Hey! Get back here! You're an asshole, Davis! Try for that gun again, and I'll cover the bricks with your daydreams! We had a deal! Still do. Well, pal, 
I snooped around for that girl you asked after, but the deeper I dug, the more I found out about little old you. You never said you were with the Corvus. I never said I wouldn't give you a new lead tooth either, but I will if you don't start talking, Daryl. You said you saw her. You saw this woman here in Boston. Where? When? Spill it. All right, all right. Look, I don't know why you care anyway. The date didn't look important enough. Where? The Opera House. Last night, she was poking around the back doors after hours. Was she with anyone? Alone, I think, at least at first. I tailed her, though, and she met up with someone at a motel. Which one? The one down on... Damn! Ow! Ow! Ouch! Oh. 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 Welcome to Boston, 1944. This is how my night is going. My name is Alistair Deus. I'm a private investigator, but for right now, I'm kind of my own personal case. Finding the bitch who killed my father. Poor Daryl there just gave me the best lead I've had in quite some time. That is, before someone painted the bricks with his brain. What? I was just about to come out from behind the dumpster when I heard those ominous heels clicking in the alley. I had to squint in the dark. She was a tall gal, aptly dressed for a funeral, hauntingly pale with bobbed raven black hair that framed her sharp cheeks. A smoke stick clamped between her teeth. She approached the corpse that used to be Daryl. Well, well. <laughs> she can't see me. Who the hell is she talking to? Daryl? She didn't notice that one side of his head was blasted open? A crow flew over my head and landed beside the tall woman's heels. To what do I owe the pleasure? She grinned and bent down, gently stroking the crow, but her eyes stayed fixed in my direction, as if she knew I was there. I half expected her to call me out for snooping. She knelt between the crow and Daryl's corpse. I wasn't sure my eyes were working right, but it looked like a faint mist was evaporating out of her. When the mist disappeared, she rose and stole a last glance back at me. She knows I'm here, and I know what she looks like. Hey, stop! Uh, you're a witness to... <sighs> She's gone. Damn it! Well, I guess it's time to call Earl. Earl? Yeah, it's me. I think we may need a bag and a mop. As Earl and the boys pulled up, I felt a faint pain in my shoulder. I'd been so distracted, I forgot I was grazed by a bullet earlier. Lucky for me, this thing was fading. Quick healing really helps in my line of work. Where's the stiff, Al? Uh, this way. Uh, watch the glass on the curb. The shooter took out the light. Earl and I go way back from the early days when I first joined the force. We were just basic officers then. Eventually, he got promoted to lieutenant and I joined the CID. That is, before I decided to leave and work for myself. I have someone to find, and I won't find her using the department's methods. One in the head, another at the light, let's see. Two in the bricks and one in the trash. Any more bullets let loose, or is that it? Uh, I think one went out in the street. It looks like one got you, Al. Oh, <laughs> yeah, forgot about that. <laughs> hey, someone get over here and take this guy to the hospital. No, Yo. no, no, no hospitals. It, uh, it wasn't a bullet. There was, uh, wet paint near my apartment, and I wasn't paying attention. And the tear in your sleeve? It snagged on a nail in the snagged phone booth. I don't think so. I know blood when I damn well see it. Give me that arm. Mm. No wound I can see. It sure looks like blood, though. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? But it's paint. Paint. I know you said you was a fast healer once, but I... If it was blood, I'd think I'd have a pretty ugly gash, yeah? No one heals that quick. Uh, no one except my brother and me. You'll meet him later. Damn convincing paint. So who's the stiff? Daryl Heller. I was getting info from him before someone decided to use him for target practice. You getting info for a client? Nah, personal reasons. Henrietta? Henrietta. Turns out she's here in Boston. Damn. Think the shooting's involved in your search? I'd be a pretty terrible investigator if I didn't think so. And it's too convenient. Practically every informant I get something out of gets terminated one way or another. But this is the first time I hear she's in town. 
I'd be willing to bet she's the shooter herself. Did you get a specific location? Nah, Daryl only saw her snooping around the opera. That's all I got before he bit the bullet. I'll send some boys to stake the place out. Come on, I'll give you a ride home. I don't want you walking out here with a shooter on the loose. Right. Yeah, just my office will do. I have to file all this mess. Hey, guys. I'm taking our home. Keep this area secure. You're not going to keep me in the dark on a single speck of dust in this case. You get me? You find even a strand of hair you think belongs to her, you call me. This rug isn't getting pulled out from under me by the cops. You're already involved, son. You're a witness and a consultant. Be the first guy I call, whether you like it or not. Damn right I will be. <laughs> and thanks for the ride, Earl. My office is on the first floor. Wedge between an old consignment shop and a laundry. Nothing fancy, but that's how I like it. It's getting colder. Something feels off. What is up with that creepy broad and those dirty winged rats? Is she keeping tabs on me? Yeah, she'll be back. And boy, is she in for one hell of interrogation. Last night had been a living hell. The search for Henrietta has never been this close. But I had to put it aside for today. My sister-in-law needs food for the week. Not only that, but my brother is due back from the war. And he was injured. Lost his whole damn leg to a Nazi landmine. His family had a quaint little home outside of Boston. Like the ones you'd see in the papers. The kind that seemed a little too wholesome to be real. With its white painted exterior and happy red shutters. I walked down the stone path, but stopped short when I found my sister-in-law planting a small patch of tiger lilies by the door. <laughs> Son, if you want flowers, you should let me do it. You can't be out here. I can be wherever I damn well please. I just found these growing behind the house and thought Ollie would like to see some color in the front when he comes home. You know what else he'd like to see? His family, still at home and not taken to an internment camp for being Japs. Now go on. I got what you asked for at the market. Uh, you need help with the cooking? No, I'll handle it. Thanks, Al. But you could help set the table. Sure could. Uncle Al, you're supposed to come home hours ago. <laughs> Five minutes isn't exactly a few hours, Stephanie. But it's nice to see you two, sweetheart. Why don't you go get your brother? Tell him he'd better get his rear out of bed if he wants any of this fine dining. <sighs> hey, Uncle Al. Ah, up late, huh? He was studying. I'm giving him an exam next week in science. His last score was less than great, so I'm giving him another try. Ah, well, good to see you studying into the wee hours of the morning for it. Anyone home? Welcome home, Dad! Kifiso, <laughs> Micro Luthi. Just look at how big you've gotten. <laughs> Ollie. Mm. Oh, my love. Al, good to see you. Same to you. Glad to see you're still in one piece. The letter we got said your leg was blown off. They must have met my buddy, Eddie. He was in my platoon and, well, um, so how's work been? It's been a while. I hope Earl's still giving you enough cases. Oh, I get plenty. And this latest case takes the cake. What is it? Uh, I'll tell you about it over drinks later. Wouldn't want son's fine cooking to get cold. After lunch, I took Ollie into town to relax and get a feel for city life again. We went to see a flick. Then, that evening, I took him to a bar two blocks away from the theater. So, there's news on my hunt. With Henrietta? Damn it, Al. Haven't I told you to drop it? She's not someone you want to find. Well, don't have much choice now, do I? What are you yapping about? Something tells me you aren't going to like the tip I got last night. And what poor schmuck gave you that tip? Mm. Better question, is that poor schmuck still alive? It's not my fault someone keeps scratching off my leads. Actually, it is. You know better. You know what our mother is capable of. Al, look, do me a favor. Stop looking for that old hag. What do you even expect to do when you find her? Same thing she did to Pop. I'm gonna put a bullet through her teeth. 
It was the most distinct memory I had in my childhood in New York. Everything before that point was pretty blurry, but the deafening bang of, a, of her gun going off in Pop's mouth, I remember that, and I never forget. And after that, after you shoot her, what's next on your to-do list? Won't know till I get there. So what was the tip? If your informant died over it, it had better have been worth it. <sighs> ah, it was. Looks like the family reunion's coming to us. <laughs> God, no! Don't say it! She's in Boston. At a theater, to be specific. Damn it, Al! When? A few nights back. What the hell is she? Wait. What year is it again? 43? Uh, 44. Shit. It's been that long? What? Since we seen Ma? Guess so. 42 years of being a ghost and now she just pops up? And I don't even have to hop a few states, or even a few countries for it. (laughs) Damn crazy luck for me, that's for sure. It isn't luck. She's here for a reason. And what reason do you think she's here for? Just... call it a hunch. Oh. There was something else. say that. Her being here is bad enough. Ah, there was another dame there last night when my guy was shot. Oh. Well, isn't that just swell? Who else? I don't know her name. She was a spooky looking gal, pale as a ghost, seems to have a thing for disgusting scavenger birds. And I think... I think she did something to my informant's body. I don't know what though, it was dark, but it it kind of looked like... Nah, never mind, I, I was probably seeing things. Yeah, I'd say you're right there. Hey, come on. Want to do some snooping around with me at the theater? Hell no. Go and take a look yourself if you want. But I have to warn Son and the kids. I swear to God if Henrietta shows up. He rose from his stool and went to hail a cab. It was dark out now. I started towards the opera house alone. Might not want to go that way. Oh, what the? Right here. Big cat. Sitting at a cafe's outdoor table and smoking from a long stick, right next to me was a dark-haired broad in a black, wide-rimmed hat. It was the same woman from last night. Well, this must be my lucky day. Listen here, doll. You and me, we're going to have a little talk, and I don't expect to do much of it. Get me? (laughs) Sounds great, big cat. But I don't expect to start wagging my tongue until I get the answers I want. (laughs) <laughs> Not how it works. Mind if we walk and talk? I'm in a hurry. To the opera? I take it you got someone to meet there? A trigger-happy buddy, maybe? If you think she and I are buddies, then I guess you don't know much about us after all. Well, that's one question off my list. She? You talking about Daryl's killer? If Daryl was your friend who was swimming in his own brain pool last night, then yeah. Sure. So a dame did him in. Then my money's definitely on her. Henrietta hasn't given up her old habits. You know Henrietta? You could say we're acquainted. Well, what are you looking at? You look like him. Too much like him. Like who, doll? The game is 20 questions, not riddles and rhymes. So, what's your name, big cat? Alistair Deus, private investigator. And you're on the wrong end of this investigation, toots. So now I'm asking for your name. D. Got a last name with that D? I'll let you figure that one out on your own, Mr. Investigator. All right. Forget the name. But let's get something straight, sugar. I got a list of questions the size of Virginia I want answers to. And it sounds like you know more about what's going down at the opera. So move it. And don't even think about putting those pretty heels to work in the wrong direction. (laughs) A gun? Really? Why bother? I like the security. (laughs) What security? Of knowing I have the pistol and I'm the one who can blow your guts to oblivion and not the other way around. Now shut your trap before I shut it for you. Well, that's one more question off my list. Anyway. Might as well tuck it, Tiger. That little toy of yours is as threatening as a cap gun. But 
dinner. We might get you pretty far. If you make it a nice one. How about we save dinner for the next date? I'm feeling like a show tonight. <sighs> How do you know Henrietta? Is she your partner? A friend? A, a relative? Oh, good God. If I was one of her kids, I think I'd really want to kill myself. You've wanted to kill yourself before. We've all thought about I'm it. I'm pretty sure I know plenty of people who have not. I am not talking about everybody in the world, big cat. I'm talking about me and the others. Are you in some kind of cult? Um, I wouldn't call it a cult, but whatever helps you sleep at night, you do sleep, don't you? Who in the hell doesn't sleep? We used to have someone who didn't, but... He clocked out a while back. And sometimes the new recruits get similar traits as the old ones. You just never know these days. What the hell are you? Walk faster! As we approached the opera house, a copper ran up to stop us. Oh! Mr. Deus! The captain was looking for... Who's this? My, uh... Secretary. Hell, this way! Follow me and don't say a damn word until we're inside. Most of the Opera House employees were absent. The concessions abandoned, ushers and clerks downright AWOL. There should have been a crowd given the advertising signs saying an orchestra was scheduled to play half an hour ago, but there was no spectators here. The left behind wine glasses on the tables meant there had been people, but I guess the chief and everyone evacuated for whatever the hell was going on. Where the hell have you been? I called you hours ago. I was out with my brother. He just got back from the war. Yeah, great to hear. This isn't a date, Al. Get her out of here. Who's he? She stays. New secretary. Since when did you start looking for a secretary? I thought it was overdue. <laughs> Guess you never do answer your damn phone. Exactly. And I needed to take uh, notes. She stays. Fine. But don't blame me if she skedaddles after this. Tighten your stomach, Al. It ain't pretty. I've never seen something like this, and frankly, I don't know how to handle it just yet. Stop squawking and show me already. Hope you're ready, big cat. Just shut your trap, doll, and don't even think of... Oh, Lord Almighty! The main attraction that brought us here was displayed on stage. A body was strung up by wires. One hand placed on the cello strings, and the other gripping the long bow. She looked like any normal poised musician about to play a masterpiece, except her detached head was speared to the cello's neck. Oh, what the seven hells is this, Earl? A damn pig roast? Why do you think I phoned you? I want to know what happened, why, when, and what deranged little bastard did it. A giant hole had been carved in her chest cavity. Oh, damn, tell me her heart's where it should be. (laughs) Nope. Check this out. Earl shook the cello. I took out my pinlight from my coat pocket and shined a beam through the instrument's hole. There was a soggy lump of hot meat, extra pulverized. Oh, oh, Christ Almighty! Oh, oh, oh! Glad to see you're used to this kind of thing. Oh, oh! Dee had perched a pretty rear in a seat. Her long legs crossed and kicking leisurely as she kept to her smoke. I felt along the cello's base, then trailed up. I stopped at the neck when my fingers brushed over an etching there. There was strange symbols written in the wood. Bimet hiete orfia. Remember Orpheus. Do you know what that means? No. (laughs) That was a lie. Those words meant something to her. They were Greek, like me. I wasn't sure what, but I knew I didn't like it. You think it's some kind of statement? It could be. Sounds like a fable reference, but I'll have to get more details. Who was the broad, anyway? A fairly famous cellist from New York. She was scheduled to perform tonight, but that obviously ain't happening. The director's in a fit over it. I can't blame her. I glanced at the red-faced woman. She was dressed in a man's fancy tux and a black bow tie, wiping the sweat from her brow. Uh, good evening. You in charge here? Uh, Yes. Beckham. House director. Alistair Deus. Private investigator. They are letting college kids snoop around for the press? I'm 48, ma'am. I haven't been to school in a good 20 years. Hot damn. 
They must be putting something in the water these days. No, ma'am. Just Greek blood. So, Captain Hunter asked me to take a peek at your problem. Uh, um, yes, thank you. Now tell it to me straight, as much as you remember from what you had for breakfast to now. She told me everything. Most of it was useless, but I listened to anyway, writing down notes. She said she didn't sleep last night because she was nervous for the cellist opening night and stayed up smoking, killing a bottle of bourbon, talking with some people on the telephone, and making sure everything was set for tonight. I was just about to leave the house when I got the call about Pammy. Uh, the cellist? Sorry, uh, no one's told me her name yet. Uh, yes, it's... It was... Pamela Rutherford. Now, Miss Beckham, did you happen to see this woman in or near the building recently? Oh, hell. Is she dead, too? Don't I wish. You recognize her? Uh, um... We might have met for an appointment once. When? Uh, 16... No. 19 hours ago. Left the opera at 1 o'clock last night. Was that before or after your appointment with our cellist over there? I... Well, I just what are you suggesting? I'm an investigator, ma'am. Don't insult me. Before or after. <laughs> <laughs> During. <laughs> Good God, lady, what's wrong with you? The dead brunette I can understand, but that old bat's got to be at least 70 by now. Boy, if she was, there's definitely something in the water. I, it looked exactly the way she is in the picture. Not a hair out of place. This was taken over 40 years ago. Well, I tell you what, she must have found the secret, because those gams were moving like weasels. Uh, don't. Just, just don't. Was there anyone else in the house I should know about? No, sir. Right then. Thanks for your time. I, uh... Mommy troubles? Uh, what makes you think she's my mother? <laughs> Who else could she be? Ah, uh, just based on a photo, anyone. But... If you're in her little cult, then she must have mentioned she had a son at one of your meetings, huh? <laughs> what other family members have you met? Any brothers? Sisters? An uncle or two? My family's none of your damn business. <laughs> oh, don't I wish, big cat. And the problem is, you all keep dragging me back in the game every time I find a nice place to settle down for a while. What does that... Uh, walk with me. Now talk. What did you mean by you all and game? And what the hell was the message on the cello about? Well, to answer your first question, by you all, I meant the Davis family. I wasn't sure you were one of them until you flashed me your card. What do you know about my family? More than I'd like to. To be honest, it's always one of you who starts the wars. Well, sure, the others have their skirmishes every now and then, but they don't usually involve the rest of us. Huh? What? Only when a deus is in the area does everyone have problems. Huh? Always trying to recruit us to their sides. Extra cash and authority promised. Rarely paid back, mind you. And not to mention all the trouble... What the hell are you saying? You make it sound like you're all part of the damn mafia. Something like that. I've got to be honest. It gets harder to care about all these laws the longer you go on. They're always changing, anyway. And what do we have to worry about except being stuck in some boring cell block for a while? Not much incentive to follow the rules when you take away the most important fear known to man. What fear? Death. You don't fear death. It's not that we don't fear it. Hell, there have been some of us who have pined for it. The sad sacks. No, we just don't worry about it anymore. Not unless it's the right time. Ha ha ha! Like when there's a gun to your head? Not quite. 
Right. Well, Dull, you say you know some of my family, which is how you know about my mother. And if you say some of them are in crime gangs, you'll know if she's in one. <laughs> in one? Daddy O, your old lady is one. She runs a whorehouse up north. Great. Then what is she doing here for gigs up north? Based on the beautiful display at the opera, she's here for the stash. What stash? Like money? Boy, oh boy, are you screwed. You are right in the middle of this war, and you don't have a damn clue what it's over. Then why don't you fill me in, sweetheart? <laughs> well, my assessment is over. You're harmless. Come on. I know a guy who'll help you out, Big Cat. I think he goes by the name Ollie. No, Ollie? Yes. You know Ollie. Do you? He's my brother. Well, yeah, but if you know him, why the hell don't you know anything else? Hasn't he filled you in? Don't tell me he's part of any gang business. <laughs> he always keeps his nose out of it. Probably why he's one of the few of you that I actually like. <laughs> His sister's not so bad either, but I don't know if she is in town. He doesn't have a sister. But we don't have a sister. Have you been down here with Ollie this whole time? Uh, what's it to you? In all that time, I would have thought he'd at least prepare you for the race. Do you even have a piece on you? You've already been acquainted with it. Ugh. Lord Ollie, what are you doing? It's Alistair, right? Look, I'm going to be straight with you for a minute. I came down here from Chicago because Rhoda phoned me some weeks ago asking for help. And Rhoda is... Your brother's wife. You don't even know that much? You must be thinking of some other Ollie because his wife's name is Sun. <laughs> That's just the cheesy nickname he calls her. Romantic sap. Anyway, I came here to help your brother with a problem. And I'm guessing that that problem extends to you, whether you know it or not. Yeah, I think Ollie would have told me if he had a problem. <laughs> well, apparently he doesn't tell you much of anything, does he? <clears throat> Something shot from the rooftop through Dee's temple and burst out the other side. She dropped in an ungraceful slump. I ducked behind a parked car, getting out my pistol. That would fire a little start in Virginia. Consider us even little Miss Bone Husky. <laughs> a a, a pop bellied three foot dwarf pointed his cane at me from the rooftop. He sounded human enough, but his horn shoulders made him look like a goddamn nightmare. He had bony wings coming out of his ankles, two for each leg. I thought for sure I was seeing things. There's the little roach. I rubbed my eyes, blinked hard, then looked again. The damn wings were still there. They flapped and lugged his heavy weight to the ground. When he touched down, he nudged his cane against Dee's body. Clean through? Man, my aim has gotten better. <laughs> you get sloppy, girl, and it ain't sexy. Ah! His figure blurred to the left so quick I almost missed it. I shot again and again. Each time the wings unfolded just when he would blur out of the way. Out of bullets. Now one of them hit the freaky bastard. Before I could run for it, he zipped out of sight. I felt something cold shove against my back. Nice try, little roach. But that wasn't done anything anyway. What the hell are you? You know what to know. And you're not going to know anything anymore. So sorry. Not the personal. Family stuff. <laughs> you get my drip. <laughs> Ouch! Ah! Ah! Pain shot through my shoulder, but it hadn't come from the back. It came from the front and burst out the back. The foreign bullet must have hit the mini demon behind me. There's someone there. Someone on the roofs. I looked up. They were just as much a freak show as the first guy. Except feminine. The silhouette gave the impression of a misshapen, contorted, and mangled heap of limbs. She had long antlers, feathers, and two extra appendages that sprouted from her back in a spiral. The new nightmare peered down at me. Gotcha. 
She flexed her twisted wings and made her way down to Mr. Many Freakin' Me. I beheld the enormity of this beautiful Terra's wingspan. The longest feathers stretched to the length of a car and a half, and they were coated in blood. The homunculus walled off from behind me, his webbed face boiling. What the hell are you doing here? He dropped his gun in a surprise, along with Dee's smoking stick and his cane. Mm, I should ask you the same. There was something familiar about her face. Mintokanete, uh, after Hermes, do not do this. Damn it, so. It seems like the mole Mr. Steer can't keep an itchy beak out of our business. The family is my business. What were you going to do after shooting our brother? Walk away with that piece and think we won't come after you? Brother? <laughs> this dirt kisser? I hurried to grab the guy's lost gun and Dee's smoking stick. I clearly saw Jim in it, and these guys clearly wanted it. I stood between the two creatures, not exactly sure where to aim the pistol. I ended up picking the goblin who shot D. Why do you want this thing? What is it? The stick was suddenly jerked out of my hand. It's mine. The damn bastard got his spit all over it. Standing behind me and wiping the mouthpiece off with her skirt and a grumble was D. I almost dropped the gun, but by some miracle I kept hold of it and thrust it at D. Aha! Uh -huh. You! I heard the cranking click of a gun behind me and felt the metal push into my head. And then... Remember, you can find new episodes of Mercury, a broadcast of hope on Patreon each day or wherever you get your podcasts. And on behalf of the Atlanta Radio Theater Company, this is Robert Drake saying, there is adventure in sound! <laughs>